Okay. Okay. Share screen. Okay. You got it. Are you? Is it up? No. Yes. It, it is. There we go. Okay. Let me uh, hide my face here. That would be the best thing for everybody. I'm a fan of not causing indigestion. So. <laughs> All right. Welcome everybody to a fantastic. Uh, session on composting let me uh see uh how many people like this can we do a quick um one minute run through you know kind of state your name and just give me a, a quick uh cool. what's your what's your interest in uh cool. in taking the class your level of whatever yes eric did, hold, hold on something? here yeah i've got everyone muted so uh i have to unmute change this a little bit here it shut me down while we were. I'm unmuted. Second. Let's so start here, with we'll Elaine. We'll, Let's start yeah. with Elaine yep. since she's. Start, you, you call you call them out, Josh. Okay, go ahead, Elaine. Why don't you give me the uh, a quick a quick synopsis of why you're why you're wasting your time listening to me babble uh, about I composting. Am time. I I am wasting my time listening to you because I tried. I have a compost bin. Okay. And I've never been successful at it. That's it. Okay. All right. Oh, and that's if there's in a nutshell, if there's a particular question with this yes. that I can answer, um, I will do so. If okay. I'm not covering it already. All right. Continue on. Uh, Sandy. Um, I do compost composting all year round, but in the summer, it's it's always kitchen compost that goes in this one container, and yes. um, it, it's always a little too wet because they don't really have leaves to put in it. And um, uh, so anyway, and I've shredded newspaper before, and maybe I need to just keep doing that, but something to keep it from being so wet. It's not right. the consistency it should be. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Kim, you will go by Kim, Kimberly? Kimberly, yeah. Yep, okay. I, I live on about half an acre, and we just started a garden this year. I've never done composting before, so I just want to learn about it and okay. my uncle has animals so I could um, add some manure in if that's something that would be mm -hmm. good for the garden or something you okay. recommend. Okay cool all right uh, Phyllis. I do the simple simple kind of composting I have a, a fence around uh, an area and I just throw stuff in, mix it with leaves and newspaper. It's really hard to turn it though. Yep. Um, but I'll see what I learn. Okay, cool. Uh, Tammy, see you're on there. Um, I, I'm like Phyllis, I've just thrown garden scraps and kitchen scraps out into my vegetable garden and I'm at the point where the critters are getting it more than it's doing any good for my soil. So I was Want you to learn more about how to make a bin and all of that. Okay. Start one. Okay. Who? Uh, Wanda? Mm -hmm. We do not have a vegetable garden. Um, we have places in our yard where we could make a compost pile, but we've never done that before. So, okay. you know, just something easy and quick would be good. Okay. okay. Eric? Yeah, I'm throwing you into this. I'm here to pick up every every time I listen to you talk or do a video. I always learn something. So I don't. We do a little bit of composting in our in our yard with yard waste, but other than that, uh, we haven't really got into the science of it. Okay, Jody, it, did you take note? That's how you can kiss up to me. That that is how to do it right there. All right, what what Jody? What's your interest? Um, I just really want to review some of the things maybe not to compost. Okay. All right. Uh, Nina, I know you're unmuted, but uh, what's what I know you're attending as a as a facilitator here, but uh, is there any questions you have? I'm just witnessing history. Oh wow see, <laughs> see that is wow. that is that is how this is done folks. That is how this is done. All right. Let's in all seriousness um, well, uh, hopefully you're seeing the, my lovely PowerPoint presentation here. Um, so, you know, what we want to talk about and my biggest, um, soapbox that I get on 
um, with, as, as Tammy being one of our uh, premier staff people knows, I am majorly uh, concerned about soil. Um, soil is literally foundational to any garden. Um, and there is so much that uh, I would say in the last 15 years, certainly in the last 20 years, um, our understanding of soil and, and has gone under under I would say has gone under revolutionary uh, changes. Um, the way we used to approach and understanding soil, especially and even up till somewhat to when I was in school um, in an undisclosed past, um, it what, what science soil scientists thought saw it as sort of uh, an inert media. Uh, that they would call it that you know this is a soil media. Um, and understood the physical and the chemical properties of soil, but did not understand the biological. And we still don't understand. There's there's so much to it um, that we are just now really starting to crank out good studies. Well, I wouldn't say just now. The last 20 years, we've been really getting a better understanding of the soil ecology. And at the heart of any good gardening um, effort is is feeding your soil. The composting side of stuff. So, uh, what we'll try to cover, um, what I normally do in, in a workshop like this is we spend, you know, uh, first probably two thirds of the class in, in lecture, and then we actually uh, go into the garden and tour um, and look at how we do composting here, um, and then then later, then we actually build um, some compost bins and well they're already pre-built but we actually build a pile. So you get a sense of how to how to make your pile. Um, so we'll we'll talk about it, and unfortunately we can't do it in person. But you'll hopefully walk away with us with at least a little, somewhat bigger and better understanding. So the the take home message I like to boil things down to essential points um, to make things simple and pithy. Um, if you feed and build the soil, then you're going to have a robust soil ecology. Then you're going to have healthy, stable garden uh, uh, ecosystems on the bigger picture and beyond the soil. That means you're gonna then help have healthy plants and that means less work, which means lazy gardener gets to go watch Netflix more. And that's what we want, okay? It's all about Netflix. Um, the role of healthy garden soil. And this is, some of this is uh, so, uh, stuff that I've talked about in our, uh, 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 God, I just went blank on our, our fall class. Eric helped me out here. Uh, uh, landscape for life. Thank you. Oh, I can't believe I need more coffee. So um, some of this is what stuff we cover in the soils class, but we'll get more specific on, on compost and we don't do that in that class. Um, but kind of the bigger view is, you know, the role of healthy, good garden soil is, it, you know, it does several things. One, it absorbs the rainfall and mitigates flooding. Okay. We know this, that we, soils that um, have a good amount of organic matter are, are more porous allows the water percolate, you know, it penetrate and, and uh, uh, percolate down through the soil better. Um, it removes that having that humus, which, which is the heart of compost, it's not the stuff that you buy in the store to dip in, um, helps to remove pollutants and clean water. You know, think of your old charcoal and at the heart of, heart of all humus is carbon. So if you think of your um, carbon filters that you would have on all kinds of stuff from, you know, water purification and, you know, like a, a Brita, whatever those uh, water jug, you know, type deals or your um, aquarium. It, it's exactly what it's doing. Carbon is a strong negative um, molecule that attracts, um, sorry, positive and attracts the, the, the negative onto it, right? And it, and it holds these things tight to the molecule, um, which makes it why it's so that's a, the heart of what makes um, it uh, uh, for, for fertile soils, which I mean, we'll talk about here. So it provides nutrients and, and oxygen for plants by opening it up. Stores atmospheric carbon. Um, it's an important carbon sink in terms of climate change issues. Provides habitat for a variety of microbes and so forth. So it's, it plays a major role. Um, and then you think about healthy soil, so, you know, like I said, soil is foundational for a sustainable, uh, habitable garden, okay? And plants get the leftovers. So when you put down a fertilizer, you think most of that's going to the plant? No, 
most of some of it gets you know maybe off gassed um some of it uh leaches into the soil uh some of it a good chunk of it gets eaten by the microbes okay and in the process of them consuming some of it they convert it to a version that the plant can ultimately use and just to give you a sense of what's going on in a healthy good like say garden loam soil right and in in a one one square meter think of that right three point something feet by three point something feet right you have um look how many bazillion you know micro or bacteria and and uh actocinomycetes right and then the next layer up the protozoas and nematodes and mites and springtails and you get more complex obviously go up until you get to the the king of that mountain is the bird, the uh, the vertebrates. Right, it, it's a massive amount. They, they, the old saying in one shovel full of, of good garden soil, right? There's more living organisms than in the entire Amazon rainforest as far as if you count only stuff above the ground, right? That's, it's a lot of stuff that's in there that we just don't see below our feet, okay? And here at Wellfield, we are majorly concerned about ethical gardening and making good ethical choices in our stewardship of the land. Um, things that we want to think about when you're when you're soil in your soil management, you want to respect and leave untouched as much naturally occurring soils as you can. Okay, if you've got unique some unique system, that's especially leave some edges of your property where you just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Okay, other than maybe removing some invasives and so forth. Um, recognize, repair, and protect all the disturbed, damaged soils, which for us at Wellfield is pretty much everywhere. Okay, Wellfield is pretty what I would consider. I don't know if uh, an EPA scientist would truly consider it and define it as a brownfield, but uh, it's basically a post-industrial site. Okay, and we have factories all around us, and in a sense, all that, especially in the groundwater layer. We are a super, we're a super fun, well, we are a super fun site. Um, we're not sure what that is. You'll have to look it up because I can't give you the direct. Just say it's seriously eco ecological issues, okay? That we are now trying to restore and heal the land and we start with the soils, okay? And then you want to choose and use your nutrient um, management strategically, okay? Which we won't get into here. It's We're going to stay focused on the compost side of it. So in a garden ecosystem, you got to think of it as, you know, a food web, right? There is, everything is interlinked, okay? Just like it is in the, and you know, when you've learned about food webs and, in, in, you know, in a prairie, you know, in, in class about prairies or woodlands or whatever other habitats. They got to think of your soil as a habitat, because it is. Um, humus is the sort of center of this, okay? Why? One, um, Carbon is a, which is the, at the center of, of that, of humus, is carbon, right? We are made up of largely carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? That's what forms organic chains. If you took any organic chemistry, you'd know that's, that's what's, and then everything else hangs off of that, okay? Every single organic molecule on Earth, every single living organism is largely made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, and it forms a stable substance, okay? It acts as a bridge between plants and animals. Okay, this this is the link that's so critical for you know to connecting plants. You got a dead you got a dead uh, a, an animal dies right, and uh, it turns back into humus into soil. Now it becomes available to the plant. Right, um, it's it's the best at retaining moisture. Okay, it per um, it can, I, if I got my number right, I believe it, it retains 25 or 35 percent by weight of the water. So it's, it acts like a massive sponge. Um, it excels at, re, at retaining nutrients. It helps to aerate the soil. Uh, and then, of course, it provides, in terms of habitat, food and housing and sources uh, for organisms that live in the soil and th that are necessary for soil nutrition. Okay. And what's important to understand is that organisms like bacteria, you know, beneficial fungi, those, those two groups especially, are 
um, what really break down some of these um, nutrients, both in terms of mineral getting stuff up from rock material, you know, rocks and back from breaking down organic stuff into a, a back into building block forms that the plants can absorb. Um, humus increases in healthy garden soils. It shouldn't ever go down. Okay. Uh, if you see a rapid decrease in the humus, um, kind of it goes from being less and less black uh, and dark to lighter, lighter soils over the years. That means you've got an imbalance or something wrong. Okay. Um, Microbes lock up nutrients, and we'll talk about this. is going to be important when we start talking about carbon-nitrogen ratios. Um, before plants can use them okay, in a carbon-poor soil. So if you were to, let's say you were to throw, you've got a, a, a carbon-poor soil and you've got plants that are yellowing, uh, older leaves are yellowing. That's a, a classic sign of, of nitrogen deficiency. So you throw nitrogen at it. Ah, that will take care of the problem. No, it won't. Those microbes will go, oh, thank goodness, you finally brought me some nitrogen. The bacteria go, thank you, thank you. That is the main, main building block of my bacteria are largely DNA. Thank you. And DNA, at the heart of DNA is nitrogen. And uh, so they thank you for giving me my building blocks, yummy, yummy, yummy. And uh, the plant goes, what the heck? Where's my, where's my portion? There's not enough for me. Okay. So microbes are the first of the table and plants eat last. Now, if you have a good, you know, um, good balance of carbon to nitrogen ratio in your soils, then that nitrogen is going to be more readily available. Okay, I'm sorry, but in soil systems they have a trickle down economy. That's just the way they are. They must be a bunch of Republicans. I don't know. So um, it's important to protect and nurture your healthy soils. Right? We want to limit this amount of soil disturbance we do. We want to restore those compacted soils. There's a lot of stuff here. And we want to do good composting. Okay. There's other things on this list, but for the sake of time, I want to get to the heart of composting. So there's a lot of forms of composting. Well, the way most people think of composting is, you know, we all think of composting as I clean up my garden bed with all that dead, nasty stuff, and I take it over to some pile and some some structure that I've created or I bought at a store and I put it in this thing and I'm supposed to do stuff for it. And out comes black gold, right? Well, you don't have to necessarily do that. Okay, so I wanna talk briefly before we get to the compost file, what you can do and some of the things we do here in many places. First, you can compost in place, okay? And one of the first, what's really important, planting a good principle in gardening is diversity. Value diversity, okay, of plant material. Not only plant species, but um, root types, okay? There are basically two types of root systems in the, in the universe of plants. There's tap roots and there's fibrous roots, okay? And of course, they're gonna have different depths and worth. The more diversity, the, that means you're providing more food for bacteria. You're also providing just a, a more robust uh, soil system, okay? Um, Con roots are constantly growing and dying, especially the root here. They're growing and dying, growing and dying, growing and dying. And that creates organic matter, okay? The reason why, and what you're looking at over here on the right-hand side of the slide, hopefully it's showing up, um, is a picture of prairie plants, okay? Their root systems go really deep in some cases. Um, it used to be that uh, before we started really heavily um, farming uh, the, the, the prairie plains of Kansas, Illinois, you know, the Dakotas and so forth, right, that, the, the tall grass prairies of the U.S., the organic layer, because the, the soil and the, the earth's crust is like a, a layered cake, okay, that organic layer, that top black layer was anywhere between 8 to 15 feet thick, 8 to 15 feet thick. That's, that's insane. Reason why? Over millennia, those root systems, which go that deep and deeper, were constantly growing, dying, growing, dying, growing, dying, and creating that organic matter. Okay, so we don't think, we always think about what we can see above ground, but it's really critical to be aware there's a whole bunch of stuff going on below ground creating organic matter, right? We think about leaves falling and stems healing over and that makes organic matter. Roots make organic matter. All right, so different plants absorb different types of nutrients, 
so that's that's another reason for the diversity. You know, you got these tap roots and some of these other roots that go deep, deep into the soil. These guys are what we'd call bioaccumulators. They suck up uh, nutrients sometimes right off the rocks. They will the roots will release enzymes that actually digest, you know, minerals right off the rock uh, surface and uh, help to bring it up to the surface. They of course are using it in their you know metabolic processes and the ends up in the leaves. The leaves then die and fall to the ground. And now that nutrient is now available to other plants whose roots are closer to the surface. So they're all part of a team. All right, so composting in place, right? By having that diversity, you take the, you, if you're trimming, okay, and this is, this, some of these things are gonna require you to have some paradigm shifts in the way you've approached, both in terms of aesthetic and a bunch of other things, okay? And or plant composting in place is literally what some people we would call chop and drop, where you, you, you make your cuttings, let's say you're trimming down a bush. You don't collect that and take it to the compost pile. You leave it in place, okay? Um, you're, you're pulling out weeds. You, uh, here we sometimes will pull out the weeds um, with exceptions of things like uh, grasses because they tend to be able to reroot themselves even above ground. Uh, if it's not, if it's in flower, you remove a flower and you throw that into the compost pile because you don't want that back out on the ground, self-seeding. But then just leave the weed there to die, right? It's now organic matter, okay? Uh, so there are all, it, we do chop and drop already in our lawns, right? What do you call mulch mowing? It's exactly that. So this isn't a completely foreign concept. We just, we want these really nice, neat beds where we've removed all of the food source, okay? And then we pay someone to take it away, and then we pay someone to make it and bring it back to us. Why haul it away? Why go through all of that and you know, expend all that energy when you can just leave it, okay? Um, so there are things that we do here to help create it, make it look more how people you know, typically define tidy. We do a lot of chipping and, and uh, in areas that where it's out of sight, I'll encourage people, my staff, to just drop the stuff right there and leave it. Um, or it's more visible, especially like in the fall with their leaves, we chop it up with the mowers and we put it back out on the bed, okay? Um, so there's all kinds of things. You can do um, cover crops, certainly organic, you know, like the wood chips and, and mulches like that are all going to help feed the soil, okay? And compost in place, they rot in place. Things to think about. Uh, another thing, I don't recommend this. This is uh, lasagna gardening, or and I'm sure it goes by a lot of other names. This is not um, some, if you've got good ground, I do not encourage putting newspaper or cardboard down and then building layers on top of it. This is an excellent method of gardening. If you are, say, uh, I have to garden on asphalt, and I've seen that happen. Um, the problem with cardboard is it does not break down very quickly. Okay, and it does not allow water and gas exchange from what's above to what's below, and you need that. Okay, so this is some sheet mulching is another term that I've heard it used. I do not recommend this as a general way of starting a garden bed. Just if you're going to make soil amendments, do it without, especially if it's thick enough, you're going to encourage, discourage most of your weeds that you're trying to suppress, which is why they use cardboard. Or newspaper. All right, um, if you're gonna compost elsewhere, there's lots of options, right? Uh, compost teas, vermicomposting or worm composting. There are mesophilic composting or cold pile, or what most people, are, when they think of composting, they think of thermophilic or heat loving composting, okay? Um, we do, here at Wellfield, we, we do that currently. Uh, that's a whole another story, but we do composting teas. We have done worm composting in the past. We currently, I work with uh, Annette Webb um, uh, from Ross. Is it Ross Sustainable? Or, uh, whatever. Um, but there, her the worm casting she produces commercially that goes into all of our uh, uh, pots that go out into the garden for display. Um, so that's an excellent uh, deal. And then of course we. Um, we chop in place, but we do not have any active composting currently on site. 
Um, we will in the children's garden as a demonstration, but to compost on the scale that we have here, I would have to get um, EPA, um, I'd have to get permission from the city and there would be a whole bunch of red tape because um, we would pretty much be deemed a commercial composting facility, which there's a whole lot of issues with that. So anyway, but for you, what we'll focus on is the thermophilic composting because this is the one that uh, requires the most thought uh, behind it. So here's things to consider and then not freak out about. Okay, um, you're gonna you're gonna have to deal with um, nitrogen losses. Um, what did I have here? Um, here's here's what's gonna happen um, with there. There are pluses and minuses to um, mesophilic versus thermophilic. Okay, uh, the biggest advantage of a coal pile, and what, what I mean by coal pile is you you gather up your garden waste, you throw it in a pile. In the back of the you know the back 40 and you leave it you don't touch it you don't turn it you don't feed it you just leave it and then say a year later you come and you scrape back the pile and you got you know some nice black stuff there that's that smells good and it's ready to go um that's one way of doing it okay it's not a very quick way so that's one disadvantage of cold piles um one of the strengths of of the cold pile method is that you're going to have a greater amount of fungi, beneficial fungi in that pile versus bacteria. Thermophilic composting tends to favor um, more of a bacterial, which it's not, it's not good or bad. Um, they will it had be advantageous to different plants, okay? Um, you're, if you are really largely growing a lot of woody plants, you're gonna want a higher fungi um, uh, to, bacterial uh, count in your soils. Um, we do happen to do soil tests here at Wellfield, just like you would your classics test that everybody you know is encouraged to do in their garden. But we also do a, a second test that we look actually and get um, numbers on our, what kind of fungi and bacterial counts we have in our soils so that I can try to manage that. So anyway, thermophilic composting. Um, it's going to be uh, able to, uh, one of the advantages to it is you're going to be able to, if you've got soil borne pathogens and you're bringing that into that, the, the heat, if you get it, can get it hot enough. That's the challenge for the homeowner. If you get it hot enough, which is at least 140 degrees um, or hotter, you're able to kill off a lot of those soil pathogens. Okay. So that's, that's an important thing to be aware of. If you're, if it doesn't get hot enough, you, you could have issues. So sometimes it's best to take those things and just put them in the trash. Um, you're gonna wanna consider your location. You're gonna wanna consider um, the, the needed space for the, the bin, bin or bins that you're creating. Um, resources that you're gonna need are of course the ingredients that are gonna go into it. You're gonna want some uh, a water source handy. Uh, what kind of tools you're gonna use and of course available materials, okay? Um, and then the lastly, you're going to have to think about what, as one person mentioned, the method of turning and then also your method of harvesting and storing. And the picture you see there um, is the kind of classic three bin system. And we have, uh, and the, we will have in the children's garden, we have it's out there, but it's not active right now, an example of this. So the far left bin is where you would store stuff that's ready to be put into the compost pile. Okay, it's, you just collected it off, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of gardening session, you just toss it in there. The middle bin is where you would actually do the active mixing. Uh, and then the far right bin is you gotta, you gotta have a place that's dry, that um, you, where you're able to harvest and store the finished compost until you're ready to do so, okay? Unless you are harvesting and it's going on immediately in the garden. Those are all things to think about. Uh, and hopefully it goes forward here. Okay, good, so more things to consider. And I apologize, apparently on this version of my, uh, my PowerPoint, um, you're not able to, let me end this and I'll move this uh, diagram out of the way. I thought I went through this and changed everything. So anyway, so what you got um, is, your, is where are you gonna put your, um, your compost bin location? I, you know, a lot of people like to put it out of sight, out of mind, way back out of the way. Um, 
I would encourage you to put it as close to where you're actually generating the compost or the organic matter as possible. Okay. Um, if it's if it's largely coming your source of organic matter, you know, cuttings and, and garden waste is, is uh, the vegetable garden. Put it somewhat near the vegetable garden, right? Why why make this hard and lugging it across the yard? Um, the space that you're going to need is at least for the actual turning pile, a minimum of 27 cubic feet. So three foot by three foot by three foot square, which is what you're seeing there um, in that picture. Um, your bin's going to need to have, and I don't know if I've covered, we'll cover this in another slide here, I'll have to see, um, is uh, you're gonna have to have slots some way for airflow to move through because the, uh, the decomposers are gonna need oxygen, just like you and I need. Um, and that's where the water comes in. Um, the reason why this, this magic number of, of a cubic yard there is that's the minimum what we've learned from, you know, studies is it's the minimum biomass needed to generate enough heat. Okay. If you've got the right ingredients and the right balance to actually break that down in a, in a hot pile. Okay. If you're just doing cold composting. There's, there's, there's no space requirements here. But in this case, this is what you need. Okay, let me uh, continue. So, so more things to consider is uh, soil and white organisms, the decomposers that you're looking to feed here, need a balanced nutrition just like your pet. Just think of them as your pet. And uh, what that means, oh, let me make sure that this, this uh, I'm gonna make sure that this uh, particular picture here wasn't hiding something else. Okay, good. Apologize for that. Um, so that what that means is the right balance of carbon and nitrogen, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then it, less important, but still to a certain extent, is the soil pH. Okay. Next, you're gonna it's you know you don't want to feed your your soil microbes, your micro herd, um, you know junk food. So this is not you know we're not feeding them Fruit Loops. You wouldn't feed your kids Fruit Loops. They don't you know don't feed them to to your uh, your little your little buddies. Uh, of course, you're going to need to give them a drink of water, and they're going to need to be able to, you know, have a breather, right? So now let's talk about this this miraculous carbon nitrogen ratio thing, okay? That uh, I've been talking about, and you may have seen or heard and talked about in in other articles or whatever I'm about composting. So why is the carbon nitrogen ratio important? So the reason is um, in part, and think of this kind of gets back to the whole um, plants eat last and the, and the, and the silo, you know, the soil microbes uh, eat first. And everybody needs that nitrogen. It's a, it's a scarce resource. The, you know, if there's, everything's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, it's all over. It's ubiquitous, right, in the soil. Nitrogen, not so much. And it's in a major part of, of, DNA, all kinds of stuff. So whenever you know nitrogen shows up on the scene, everybody's in the bread line trying to get their get their piece. Okay. And they will take that and combine it with the carbon to make, you know, the building blocks to make their body work. Okay. And different food stocks or different, you know, things that you would put into that pile have different ratios. And the, you can see some examples there. Uh, what we would consider a finished humus, a finished, quote unquote, finished compost, ready to go out in the garden, has a, a carbon ratio of about 10 to one, okay? And then some of these have some varying different levels of carbon to nitrogen. Table scraps, so the stuff like uh, Sandy, you were talking about that you're putting out there, that's a 15 to one. Grass clippings, 19 to one. Sawdust, 500 to one, right? It is, it is dry wood, the nitrogen's been stripped out of it over time, and it's basically pure carbon, you know, hydrogen and oxygen, okay? Which is when you burn it, that's what you get, right? All right, so here we go. Um, and these are, some, these are some things that you wanna use, and these are some things that you want to avoid putting into your pile. Things you can throw in there, coffee grounds great nitrogen source, right? We all know this, we've put, you know, you've always been told to put it on your roses and other nitrogen loving plants. Eggshells, great source in calcium. 
Also, it's the, for the worms, it's a roughage. It's important for their dietary tract. Uh, ground up corn cobs, vegetable and fruit scraps, grass clippings, straw, pine needles, shredded leaves and twigs, um, seed, and disease, seed and disease free weeds are important. Don't take uh, your uh, powdery mildew covered, you know, pumpkin leaves or cucumber leaves and throw them in your compost pile. You're just saving it up for next spring where it's going to re inoculate. Get rid of it, put it in a trash bag, burn it, whatever you got to do. Just don't put it in your compost pile. Okay. Wood chips, wood shavings. Things you want to avoid, of course, again, the, all that nasty weed seed. Now, if you were turning it and actively checking the temperature, you know you're getting it up to over 140 degrees. Um, that's the magic number that, that uh, is needed to be reached to kill off most of the nasty path, uh, pathogenic um, fungi and, and uh, bacteria and so forth. Okay. Um, uh, meat, bones, grease. Fat, so your salad dressings, if you had a salad that had, you know, any kind of dressing on it, don't throw that in the in there. You're going to have to pitch that, okay? A lot of it's because of the, the, the lipids, the, the fats that are in there. They don't break down well. You end up with this greasy, nasty smelling stuff. Um, seed and fruit pits. So that's maybe where your, your animal attractant is coming from, um, potentially. Um, Feces from any kind of carnivores, right? Cats, dogs, no good. So manures that are coming from, um, say, chickens, um, any of your herbivores, that's, a, that's, a, that's not a bad option. Um, I don't know about pigs because pigs, I believe, are omnivores. So um, they're kind of opportunistic. I would not probably put pig uh, in there. And you're better off if you kind of set that aside and allow that um, kind of manure to age a little bit before you throw it into the compost. And there's literature out there on that that it probably will speak better to it than I do. All right, so things to consider, uh, more things to consider is uh, a better slide apparently in presentation. I'm gonna have to, have to get Tammy to fix this up for me. She's, she's a guru at this. Um, oh, there you go. So you're looking at um, three different, um, say, methods of turning the pile and what I would call bulking agents, or actually what the, the pros call bulking agents. Bulking agents are what's going to fluff up and provide air, okay? So the picture, this little guy right here, right, this is a, a commercially available compost bin. Um, it is, you know, there's usually a crank on the side allows that you know that to um barrel you know barrel to turn um there there's i'm sure pinterest is full of all kinds of deals and supposedly you turn it and then you're able to you know tip it and dump it right into your compost or into your wheelbarrow when you're ready to go fill uh the picture here um is that a picture of me i can't remember uh, i'll show you a picture of the actual compost bin that i use at my house uh you can use a trash can um where you put in holes and so forth um, or you just have a pile that you then have to kind of fork and turn. Okay, so there's all kinds of, uh, of one way of roll. You could put it in the trash can and then turn the trash can over and roll the trash can. That's that's an option. So I'm sure there's all kinds of ingenious people out there who come up with stuff. Methods of harvesting. You have to have some way of being able to physically separate. Okay. The uh, commercial composters have great big tumblers, you know, screeners that, you know, screen it down to a quarter. You want, basically, they typically have screens that bring it down to a quarter inch in size. If you're looking here uh, in my house, um, the way I, I built a frame, this is actually half inch uh, hardware cloth, not quarter inch. I ended up actually putting a second layer on to kind of restrict the size down a little bit further. Um, and I just kind of rub and sift it through the, the, the quote unquote finished stuff falls through into the wheelbarrow. Um, and then the rest is then put back in the compost pile. So there's, I'm sure there's lots of other methods too. And that's, uh, and that's another good homework assignment for you, but they, you need some way of being able to physically separate. Okay. Your, your stuff. All right. Types of compost bins. This guy here, uh, commercially available, um, you can see that it's got the air slots built into it. It's built at the right size, okay? 
Um, they often will come, you know, this one might have um, the ability to flip open the door. One of the disadvantages is being able to access, access this to be able to then turn the pile, okay? Not so easy. Uh, the one, the, oops, the picture in the center here, this is actually my compost, this bones, <coughs> one of my compost bins at home. It's just two uh, trash cans. I cut the bottom out of each, uh, drilled with a paddle bit, uh, one inch holes all around for allow for airflow. Um, one of the things that helps to keep that um, compost from getting too wet, right? Reason, one of the reasons why it gets too wet is you don't have enough bulking agent in there. If you take, uh, the way I do that is I include small twigs in there. Um, I break them up so they'll actually fit in. They kind of interlock and create these, these you know, negative spaces naturally uh, that then help to kind of keep things separated. Some people have slid PVC pipe in with holes. There's all kinds of ways that people have tried to introduce airflow into the pile. And the turning process, the most recent important reason why you're, you're turning it is you're actually fluffing and you're incorporating uh, oxygen into the pile, into that center of that pile where it gets quickly oxygen depleted. The worst thing you want to do is to have decomposition happening under anaerobic or lack of oxygen conditions. What you get, and you know you've got that, is if you've got stinky, smelly, I gotta just throw that in the trash. Dang, I can't handle that compost, okay? That's, that's stuff that is actually literally fermenting, okay? That's why it smells. You're smelling alcohols and probably other volatile organic compounds that are, I don't even know the names of, that are, we'll just call all nasty. Uh, this pile here, this is another commercially made option. It's a piece of plastic with holes in it. You wrap it around. And, and, you know, it attaches up on itself. You can, some of these you can, you know, kind of disconnect, unwrap, turn the pile. For mine, I just pull the kind of the, the tubs apart. I throw them all the pile on the ground. I turn it with a fork and then I put it back into the bin. And it's not, it doesn't take too terribly long. Um, I do have a second uh, bin kind of off to the side where I hit, use this mostly for holding. Cold, it's cold composting and it's also just holding. So when I'm ready to incorporate more um, uh, carbon. So say uh, one of the problems is having enough carbon rich materials in the middle of the summer um, when everything's green and you got lots of kitchen compost. Um, if, you, if you save some of your fall leaves and keep it set it aside, that's a great thing to be able to introduce. You know some carpenter friends, uh, introducing sawdust into that at that time is a real important way to be able to get uh, carbon rich new um, ingredients incorporated back in that pile. And that will also bring down your smelliness. So building the pile initially, you want to remember it's important to keep the nitrogen and what you're seeing here is this layering effect to help keep the nitrogen carbon nitrogen ratio um, close together. Okay. So your, your brown, and, and we'll, we'll kind of refer to this as the uh, browns to greens ratio, okay? The browns being your carbon source, things that are, are fairly, you know, brown, like your, your dead brown leaves, obviously wood, uh, newspaper, all these things are high in carbon, low in nitrogen. Things that are green, um, kitchen scraps, all those kinds of things, the, the, car, the um, coffee grounds are going to be much higher in nitrogen than the, uh, than the other sources. So you kind of create a three to four inch layer of browns for a one inch layer of, of greens. And, you just, and, then, and then if you've got some good loam garden soil, you can sprinkle that in on the pile. What you're doing is you're inoculating the pile with the microbes that are gonna be necessary. You can buy commercial uh, available um, uh, consumer grade, you know, compost inoculating kits, right? And it's all it is, is spores and so forth of, of you know, the same thing. Uh, you could spend your money and do that if you want. Um, I just take garden soil that's nice and dark and I throw it in there and that does all the job I want for what I need. Uh, throw some broken branches in there as we were talking for your, your bulking agent. And, uh, and then just keep layering it till you fill up the top of the bin, till you've got three feet by three feet by three feet. Now, uh, when to turn. So if you're doing this by the book, way the, the commercial producers do it, 
you don't do it on a schedule. You do it based on, on temperature thresholds. So as you can see that graph, um, the spike at the, on the far left is immediately after turning or within a few hours or days of peak, it will peak. You, they do make these long thermometers. That you, they, they stick down into the center of these windrow piles that they do and they check the temperature. When the temperature reaches 140 plus, that's their trigger that, that they know they need to turn, okay? And then what you're seeing there is over time, as they continue to turn, the, the temperature gets less and less and less because things are getting broken down. There's less um, biological activity going on. We've all seen the steaming piles of mulch and compost, right? What you're seeing there is the off-gassing of ba largely bacteria doing their thing. That's, the, that's bacteria breath, okay? Um, and what you want to do is try to keep that pile at that, within that kind of range there that is, as indicated when it gets too, you know, too cold, it's time to return it. I don't do that, okay? I'm, uh, even, even in my home pile, I'm not, I'm not that much of a nerd. I, I will turn it actually very, oh, I do it at the best when I'm really doing, I'm, I might do it every two weeks or so. Now it ends up being a lot less than that. I won't disclose that to you, <clears throat> but, um, uh, so I'm kind of combining cold and hot together, okay? And uh, in, in that case, and if you are actively turning it regularly like that, I have been able to get compost within 60 days, okay? But the, certainly that's the turnaround time, and I'm sure compost, commercial composters probably can do it even faster. Um, that means I harvest uh, usually twice a year at home. I've been able to, um, in other jobs where I was actively, you know, composting with free composting bin system, I was harvesting at least three or four times a year um, and producing a fair amount of compost that was actually usable. So um, maintaining the pile, you want to manage your moisture levels. You don't want it to get too wet um, where it is just when you squeeze it and it stays a ball, that's too wet, okay? When you, when you squeeze it and it kind of jostles a little bit and it falls apart nicely, that's a good, that's a good temperature, okay? It's sort of like taking a, a sponge and, and wring it out. That's about the consistency you want. So if, it, if your pile's getting too dry, it's draining out too much, it's got a lot of airflow, um, you've got, you know, a lot of carbon but not enough nitrogen, you certainly can go in. I've done it with watering cans or with the hose, as you can see in that picture above. Um, adding water, certainly good to do as you're initially building the pile. Kind of keep an eye visually on, do you, are you, and I think three to one, greens to brown or brown to greens is kind of how I continue, just keep it simple. And I'm not, you would see the literature talking about, you know, a 30 to one ratio or something like that. Just keep it simple. Um, you want to make sure that there's some moisture. You want to make sure you're continually adding a bit of this and a bit of that. And I, I, you, I monitor it what, at the time of when I turn the pile. Um, that's when I might, I literally sometimes just rip up some grass or I, I take grass clippings off of the mower and I throw it in there. Um, whatever you got to do, okay? Um, so composting, last slide here, composting applications. Um, you can do top dressings. Um, if you're into vegetable growing, it's, re it's recommended to put down one inch of compost twice a year. So you might do that, say, at the beginning before you plant, and then sometime in June, July, after you know, a lot of that's been depleted, you might put another round on, um, kind of around the, the plants. Uh, one to two inches of compost uh, once a year for ornamentals. Now, that is not something that is practical for us in a high visibility aesthetic situation, we're not gonna be going in and spreading and the amount of acreage. What we do here is uh, every time, you know, our, our we remulch a, a garden bed of every about every three years or so, we will add a one inch to two inch layer of compost at that time and then put another two inch layer of uh, ground up wood mulch on top of that. And then that, is allowed to break down over time, adding to the carbon soil. We also are spraying uh, compost teas to inoculate and kind of really try to introduce a lot of micro diversity into the soil to get that engine going. Um, 
We also add it to potting mixes and containers. As I mentioned, our potting mix that we use out there that's a commercially made product is actually a compost-based potting mix, not a, uh, a peat-based, which is the standard um, soilless media that you can get commercially. Um, so, and then we add the, the worm castings to that, and that's uh, how we uh, utilize it here um, on site. I believe that's it. And um, we're kind of up against our time here, but uh, we could, if we, there is still some questions that uh, I didn't answer, and if I can bring up my. Josh, there was one right yeah. here at the end from uh, Kim. Uh, she asked about the hot compost. Uh, does it get, actually stay hot even in the winter? Oh yeah, yeah. If you if you're doing it correctly, you know the commercial composters are composting year round. You know, ambient temperature doesn't matter. I mean, obviously, it's going to um, your pile's going to cool faster in the winter than it would in the summer, right? But um, you certainly can continue to do so. Um, I'm just not that motivated to get outside at zero degrees or 32 or to to do it. So I just let it go. <laughs> Um, but you certainly could. I, you, there, there are designs out there for actually um, um, use, creating hot water heaters out of compost. Um, you could actually heat your shower water with that. Um, there's all kinds of cool, you know, there are biodigesters that, uh, that schools have that quickly break down uh, stuff into compost and then they can, you know, and that can be a source of heat. Nice. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of weird, crazy stuff you can do with compost. Cool. Another one, uh, is newspaper uh, okay for the composter? Yeah, so if you, again, being aware of what the, the starting carbon nitrogen ratio of that ingredient, all right? I use, uh, I'll throw a newspaper or office paper, any kind of paper. Uh, it's going to be higher in carbon, obviously, than to nitrogen. So if I'm really needing to have browns, that's another way in the summer. But you've got to rip it up into as small pieces as possible. Otherwise, you're 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 creating these layers of. Well, it's sort of like taking your your uh, grass clippings. Have you ever seen that? Right, and you just pile, it and it just creates this matted mush, right? Mm -hmm. And that that does not allow airflow to move around. So, right, that's in general breaking stuff down. You know, the bet. Let's the bacteria are lazy, right? They let's break it into small enough pieces that they can take a bite out of it. That's that's cool. Uh, Elaine also asks, uh, do hickory nuts count as uh, dry? That'd be something. Yeah, my my experience with any of the like uh, the pits, like if you know, I've, I'll eventually um, if I've you know threw peaches or you know whatever kitchen scraps, and I'll next spring, you know, year later, I will pull, I'll be pulling those pits out. Also, if you have walnuts and that kind of thing, definitely do not add anything walnut leaves. Walnut, uh, the the actual fruit of the walnuts, wood of walnuts, um, it's it create you know it contains that juglinase that uh, is so toxic to so many vegetables, especially tomatoes. That's a really good that's a really good point. Hey uh, everyone, I'm happy to unmute everybody here. If you have a loud rock music playing in the background, uh, be be prepared. So if, if anyone wants to toss in any questions here go ahead and feel free you, or, can unmute, you can unmute yourself too or if you've got a uh you know an idea or an experience that uh, can be helpful and you want to add to yeah. the pool of love here go for it sure hey so like i oh, am i supposed to raise my hand no go ahead go ahead Elaine. Okay. Um, the, uh, I, I added another question like these are the hickory nuts it's like the shells that the squirrels leave behind right after they've eaten them so that would be okay i yeah that that should be fine because that, that you consider that like a bulking agent it will break down eventually but okay. it's going to be really really slow i got i've still got branches in my pile probably from I, when i originally put them in the pile oh yeah you know, seven years ago or four years however long i've been living in that house so they wood breaks down really really it's cellulose it, Cellulose does not break down easily. Yeah, that's true. That's awesome. Well, hey, I will uh, I will get this uploaded and have it hopefully within 24 to 48 hours. I will have the link ready on YouTube. 
and we'll be able to send that to everyone. And I'll also link it back to the place on our website where you might have been routed through to actually find this class. We'll post them there. That way people can check them out for, uh, for the future. And there'll be an eternal reminder of our time <laughs> here spent in, uh, spent in stay at home during the Eric, coronavirus. So, what, yes, sir. What, just, I, I don't know if I, I, the state of health. So uh, there was a question about uh, how turning or something along those lines. That the way I do it personally, and it's a little more backbreaking. That's why people invented these drums and other methods of, of turning. Um, is I, I, you know, I dump it all back out. It allows me to see the whole pile and know what I can incorporate. And then I, I just use a pitchfork or a mulching fork, something that I can get in and literally, you know, toss salad to be able to kind of fluff it up and get things back in there. So okay. that's how I hey, personally Josh, do it. Yes. When you toss it out, what are you, are you putting it like in a wheelbarrow or where are you putting it? Just so on the ground. I, literally on the ground. any of it? Um, I will lose probably a little bit into the into the grass there as far as the finished product, but it is an it at least for me it's been inconsequential because I still get uh, off of that two uh, two can system I get at least a half a wheelbarrow load of compost every time I I'm up. it's not a lot but yeah. I don't have I have you know three foot by three foot you know raised beds for my vegetables and that's what I use it on. So it's enough for me. So okay. you could put down, you could put it on a tarp or take it to your uh, cement pad. If you have a, like your driveway, if you wanted to take it that far. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I just do it right there on the ground and not really worry about it. Okay. So I have another question too. My uh, compost container looks like Darth Vader's helmet. Yes, um, I got that one. Want, uh, I do too. So anyway, does, did you put tarp underneath it? Do you set it on tarp or is it right on the ground? No, it's right on the ground. What that allows, it actually allows worms can smell organic rotting stuff from great vast distances, I mean, literally big distances, and they will travel underground okay. to the pile. Okay. So it allows those microbes to actually that are in the soil to come up into the pile and start breaking it out. Oh, okay. Okay. That's good. It also allows water for you know water to drain out. You no, don't want that sitting at the bottom of the pile. Right. right, that's true. Thank you. I have, a question. I have a question. Yes. Sorry if I missed this part because my son was driving his bike in the road and I had to go stop him. But um, can you just throw <laughs> stuff in a pile without it being in a trash can or a special bin? Sure. Yeah, of course you can. Okay, and then it's just a three to one ratio, and then you just turn it every two weeks. Yep. You. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, if you want it, you're supposed to turn it when it gets up to a certain temperature. That's the ideal. But very few of us actually are going in and sticking like a, a, a nice long meat thermometer in there, kind of thing. You can get. You can buy. I'm sure you can get on Amazon. A. It looks like a large meat thermometer um, to stick into the pile. It just has to be able to go in far enough to actually get a sense of in in towards the center of the pile. How? What's the temperature? in the core of the pile. The surface temperature out here isn't as important as what is it in here, because this is where the oxygen, where it's most deprived and where you want to be able to turn it. But okay. you need at least a cubic yard. So having the container is just, it helps to keep it nice and neat. Um, and it helps to literally give you a visual sense. Yes, I got it up. Okay. Thanks. Hey, before we wrap up here, one quick sort of an informal poll. I think I know how this will go with this group. Um, we, Josh and I have been talking about a while back, maybe even setting up a uh, ask the gardener type of sessions where maybe for an hour, it's just a come and go as you please, uh, or you can stay for the whole session and listen, but literally just a question and answer session. Anybody here interested in scheduling something like that? Show yeah. Me yeah. Okay. I would listen in. Okay. Yep. No, Tammy, you'll be answering the questions. So. <laughs> right. All right. Hey, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, this is yes. Uh, thank you. Again, a yep. very different different experience for all of us, but uh, it's feeling a little too normal, I think. But we have learned some things that I hope we'll be able to continue. And this is th there will be some silver linings certainly that come out of all of this. So I hope everyone's staying safe and happy. 
and healthy. Make sure you're getting outside. Take advantage. It's, uh, I, I wonder, Josh, I, we had a few not appear on the roster that had signed up. I'm kind of wondering if they're outside doing lawn work right now because even though it's cold, it is beautiful. And uh, we hope that everyone's able to get outside and take advantage of that. We will be open when we're able to open. I will uh, continue to refer you to a letter that we have on our web, on our homepage of wellfieldgardens.org. It sort of gives updates. So uh, we're obviously still under the stay at home uh, order from the state as well as county health uh, or travel watches here in Elkhart County. And so as soon as we're able to open up, we'll get word out to everyone. And we're, we're, as, we're as anxious as you all are to have everyone walking out and around and enjoying because right now it just feels unfair that we're out there getting to see that every day and, and very few people get that opportunity and I know photos just aren't the same as as it is when you're when you're there so uh Josh I will let you give final sign off here but uh thanks everybody for your support by doing this and participating you are actually helping us further our mission in terms of uh both growing a little bit of community as we are here but also in that educational aspect so thanks all and Josh thank you again for your time thank yes, you. thanks guys thank you for participating Right. Uh, mwah. 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 <laughs> Take care. <laughs>